do you think that like these kinds of optimizations uh, could mean that there will be like a somewhat smaller demand at some point in the future for hardware? We, we try to design the chips around the things that we know are going to be needed. Don't think only about the chip, but rather how people will consume the chip. How can we build a chip that is optimized for deep learning workloads from the ground up? When you look at the energetic breakdown, only about half of the energy is spent on the actual computation. And with a decently sized systolic array, that's how the architecture is called, we can get to a point where 99% of the energy consumption is on the actual computation that we need to do. Ron, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. Where are you calling in from today? Hey, John. Thanks, Thanks for having me. I'm calling from the, the Bay Area, where I live. Nice. Um, and so we know each other through Shruti Koparkar. So Shruti reached out a few months ago. She uh, She's a AWS AI ML Accelerator Product Marketing Lead. It's a long job title. She must have to have like two business cards to fit that on. You line them up side by side. Um, and so Shruti is responsible for uh, marketing these hardware accelerators, Tranium and Inferentia Chips, which I've been reading sponsored messages about in recent episodes. And these products blew my mind. I didn't know that AWS was working on them before, and I became so fascinated by them that I asked Shruti if we could have someone come on and do a hardware-specific episode. So she found you, an amazing speaker on this, like you're a world expert in this. It's so great to have you on. And so in this episode, we're going to dig into all of the hardware that is driving the AI revolution today. So such an exciting episode. We haven't had an episode that's deeply focused on hardware like this before. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah, so let's start off by talking about CPUs versus like GPUs. And we're gonna get, get into things that are like <laughs> GPUs in a moment, but let's start off just with GPUs. So um, CPUs, you can probably explain this way better than me, but they like, they're kind of the workhorse of a computer. They're like the most versatile uh, kind of computing device on the machine. And so, uh, yeah, they do like for the regular kind of running of programs on your machine, they're doing most of the work. But GPUs allow, like they have, and again, you can explain this to the audience better than me, but it's something like massively parallel linear algebra computations originally designed for rendering graphics in like 3D video games but that same kind of linear algebra is what we're doing when we're training, say, deep learning models or doing inference with deep learning models. And so in 2012, uh, researchers at the University of Toronto, including Jeff Hinton, came up with an architecture called AlexNet that leveraged, uh, so it was a machine vision architecture that leveraged this huge uh, image net data set. And um, by using GPUs to do some of the training for this model architecture, they were able to uh, train efficiently. And, and that was like the first big, super well-known deep learning architecture and GPUs allowed that to happen. So anyway, I should let you talk. <laughs> Fill us in on like your take on CPUs versus GPUs and why they're so important in AI research. Yeah, sure. So, so let's try to break it down, right? So the, the way I look at CPUs is, the, is that they're the ultimate general purpose machine. Uh, they're based on an architecture that existed for, for a long time called the von Neumann architecture. And the way that CPUs perform computations is that they bring data from an external memory to registers that are local to the CPU, to the hardware circuit that runs the computation. They read registers, perform a computation, and then write the results back to registers. And at least until recent years, these registers were scalars. So think about a single floating point number. Uh, the, uh, the beauty of this architecture is that it can really do anything. And that's why CPUs are used everywhere that you can think of. The downside of this architecture is that there's a lot of overhead in decoding an instruction in order to just multiply two scalars together or something like that. Now, modern CPUs in recent years improved that to some extent with vectorized instructions, but that's a, an incremental improvement over the fundamental architecture that is there. 
Uh, what GPUs do, so GPUs indeed were, uh, at the beginning at least, were optimized for graphic or for, uh, for graphics or for massively parallel workloads. Mm-hmm. And graphics was the first use, use case that, that uh, kind of led for the emergence of this architecture. And the idea with the GPUs is that the, the fundamental concept is the same, but instead of using a few very powerful cores, you use thousands of weaker cores. And then if you have a workload that is massively parallelizable, like matrix multiplications or like graphics where you compute a different pixel of an image, then you can parallelize the workload on all these slow, uh, slower or, or, or not as powerful cores and perform the computation in parallel and get an end-to-end acceleration. But if I try to tie that back to, to AlexNet that you mentioned, I think uh, what was interesting about the AlexNet paper was that it was as far as I know, the first uh, the first example of using a neural network with a very deep and a deep uh, number of layers and with a very large data set. So basically the leverage of scale in order to achieve state of the art results. In that case, it was was for a vision benchmark or workload. Mm-hmm. Um, and because they scaled the amount of computation needed, so aggressively versus previous neural networks, they needed massive parallelization and they achieved that with GPUs. I see, and it was a huge achievement. It blew all of the other machine vision models at that time out of the water and it brought deep learning to everyone's attention. It was something like a 30% reduction in errors relative to the next best model at that time. And so all of a sudden academics and practitioners alike took notice and by a year later, all of the top architectures in this machine vision competition were deep learning architectures, whereas the year before there was just the one. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Yeah, all of a sudden deep learning started to be everywhere. Um, and 10 years later, it really is. And it's, I mean, it's mind blowing what's changed over 10 years. Uh, it's mind blowing what's changed over the last year. <laughs> right. I think it was a mindset shift, by the way. I think uh, that that architecture, architecture allowed everyone to think that a neural network algorithm can, by itself, win against all the Taylor algorithms that we built as a community over a decade of uh, vision optimizations and so on. And that actually trailblazed the same exact achievements in other fields as well beyond, beyond vision. Right, totally. So... Uh, a term, some terms that you used in your description of CPUs versus GPUs, um, which, you know, I think I would normally just kind of let the person get away with saying them, but I really want to understand what it means. And you can explain it to me. So you talked about CPUs having a small number of strong processors and GPUs is having a large number of weak ones. So what is it that makes a processor strong or weak? You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so there's there's a couple of, of things to to kind of pay attention to, but at the heart of CPUs and GPUs, that there is a hardware data path that we build, and that data path processes instructions. These instructions could be as simple as add or multiply two scalars together, and there's also control instructions or data movement instructions. So think about loading a value from memory or saving a value to memory. Now, that data path runs at a certain frequency, and state-of-the-art CPUs run at a frequency of uh, somewhere around 3 gigahertz. Uh, And that basically means that that's the speed in which we do calculations. Now, on top of that, the the data path has a bunch of optimizations in order to do multiple computations at once. So it can do multiply, and in parallel to that, load the next value, and in parallel to that, save the the previous value, and, and so on and so on. Um, so, so that's how I would describe a CPU core. When you go to a GPU core, the, this main data path is much simpler. It runs at a lower frequency uh, in order of 1 gigahertz or 1.5 gigahertz. So we're talking about 2 to 3x slower. We don't do as many things in parallel as we do in CPU. But that simplicity is actually uh, beautiful because we can make these cores extremely small in hardware and then pack thousands of them uh, in a chip and get performance that way, given that the workload is parallelizable enough. Cool. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense to me. Um, so yeah, so the 
these weaker uh, processors, they go more slowly uh, and they do simpler operations. Yep. Um, so I guess that means that like, uh, doesn't mean that they're like cheaper to make, but they're also maybe smaller. So you can fit more of them into like a given area. Like, for example, like why wouldn't somebody want, like, would it be theoretically possible for somebody to build a GPU full of like three gigahertz processors or something? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. So there is, there is a couple of reasons to that. First of all, these, these very complex uh, CPU cores, very advanced CPU cores are indeed much larger area-wise. And we do have a limitation on uh, the amount of area that we can build into a single chip. So that's one of the considerations there. The other consideration is that when we run these CPUs at a lower frequency, they're also smaller, as you said, but they can also run at a lower voltage, opera uh, uh, voltage operating point, which make them more power efficient. So yeah. in some ways, building these small and simple CPUs allows you to run more power efficient and allow you to, allows you to pack more cores in a single chip. Power efficient and probably heat as well, right? That's probably yep. a factor. Yeah. Yeah, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Cool. This episode is brought to you by Posit, the open source data science company. Posit makes the best tools for data scientists who love open source, period, no matter which language they prefer. Posit's popular RStudio IDE and enterprise products like Posit Workbench, Connect, and Package Manager, these all help individuals, teams, and organizations scale R and Python development easily and securely. Produce higher quality analysis faster with great data science tools. Visit posit.co, that's P-O-S-I-T dot co, to learn more. So, all right, so that gives us a good sense, a really great sense of CPUs versus GPUs. Um, so then when we talk about these kinds of um, deep learning training accelerators like GPUs, there's lots of these different kinds of accelerators out there today. And in my like small-minded small way, um, and this was one of the things that I really had a hard time initially wrapping my head around with your Tranium and Inferentia chips is when Shruti first came to me and I had a call with her, I was like, so these are GPUs, right? And she was like, no, no, <laughs> like they're not GPUs. Um, but in some ways you do kind of use them in similar situations to GPUs. So I'd love for you to like break down for us, how is a GPU different from the Tranium versus Inferentia chips, as well as how these differ from TPUs, tensor processing units that we hear about, as well as IPUs, these, I think, intelligence processing units. Um, so there's like all these different kinds of accelerators that we, you can, that we can use for deep learning. And I think more are emerging all the time. So yeah, break down for us like the differences. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when we started looking into Inferentia and Tranium, we, we basically stepped back and, and asked ourselves, how can we build a chip that is optimized for deep learning workloads from the ground up? So let's not take any dependency on previous architecture. Let's see how we can do it in an optimized way. And our observation was that in both CPUs and GPUs, uh, there's still an energetic overhead to performing computations. And what I mean by that is that they run instructions, and uh, whether it's with the, uh, it is with a small number of very advanced cores or, or with a, a very large number of, of more or simpler cores, they, they fetch an instruction from memory, they decode the instruction, and then they perform a relatively small computation and write the result back. So when you look at the energetic breakdown, only about half of the energy is spent on the actual computation, the floating point multiplication and addition that we need to do. So we looked for ways to, to solve it fundamentally via a different chip architecture. Uh, and we stumbled into a, a, an actually an old architectural concept called systolic arrays, in which you basically uh, you layer a, what we call PEs or processing elements next to one another. And then you, uh, you structure the computation like an assembly line. So basically there's one, we, we fetch one instruction, decode it, but then we perform one computation, move the data to the next processing element, perform another computation, move the, next, the data to the next processing element. And with a decently sized systolic array, that's how the architecture is called, 
we can get to a point where 99% of the energy consumption is the, on the actual computation that we need to do and not on instruction Whoa. decoding and fetching. That sounds like an insane increase from 50% to 99%. I was expecting like kind of like a marginal <laughs> increase or something yeah. like, but that's like, a com- it's a completely different situation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And we, we felt that this is fundamentally something that we need to, uh, to, to bet on. And we basically structured a matrix engine on this underlying architecture. Now, interestingly, GPUs also started incorporating similar ideas over time with what they call tensor cores. These are also systolic arrays, just smaller ones. We can talk about them later. But uh, the, the first idea that we had with Inferentia and Trenium is that we need to leverage systolic arrays. On top of that, the, the other idea that we had is that it's much easier to program a small number of large cores if you make them efficient enough compared to a very large number of, of uh, small cores. So we kind of wanted to get the best of both worlds with CPUs and GPUs. So make sure that we run at lower voltage uh, and then very uh, high energetic efficiency. But at the same time, make sure that we uh, have a small number of cores so that the software programming is much easier. And we did that as well with French and Trainium along with all kinds of other optimizations to, to kind of accelerate deep learning workloads end to end, because it's not only matrix operations, it's much more than that. Wow. Very interesting. Um, so then, okay, so this kind of gives me a sense of the GPU versus Trainium Inferentia difference. Uh, so TPUs, IPUs, uh, how are those different from these other options? Yeah, let's talk about that. So, so basically, in recent years, recent years were kind of golden years for uh, cheap architects because all of a sudden, this <laughs> deep learning workload came in and it's extremely popular. It's exploding in the amount of compute demand that it requires, and now people get to rethink how how we should build compute units for for this workload. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a couple of uh, architectures that emerged over the last couple of years. Uh, TPU is one of them, and it's very similar in the fundamental architecture to what we do with Trainium and Inferentia. It's based on a systolic array. Uh, it has a set of uh, supporting vector engines that we can talk about later. But I would say that TPU sits on the same camp as Inferentia and Trainium, while other architectures like IPU and, and a few others uh, take a different approach where, where the, the main idea uh, in that architecture is that we want to avoid reading and writing data from memory uh, at all costs. So basically that they they build what's called a data flow architecture where you read the inputs from the memory, but then you pass inputs from one engine to the other and try to avoid uh, writing data to memory uh, throughout the computation. Now, there are pros and cons with that approach. Uh, the advantage is that uh, you can build a, a more cost-effective system if you can do it right, because the, the, the memory system is quite expensive. So, so you can kind of uh, oversubscribe to some extent uh, your memory system, or even have a very cheap, low bandwidth memory system. Uh, but the downside, as I see it, is software simplicity, because now as we program these chips, we need to make sure that we take into account how the data flows from one engine to the other and make sure that it never get to, gets to a point where some of the, the compute units are idle because they're waiting on, on the neighboring compute units to, to get free or something like that. So it adds some software challenges that need to be solved. Very interesting. So yeah, so the pro with a TPU is that it can be cost efficient because of how they've uh, optimized to try to have data flows uh, uh, moving <laughs> uh, into memory and out of memory. Uh, but the con of that is that there's extra complexities. Uh, and if you, if that, that could mean that uh, some of these processing units are sitting idle. Yeah, that's for IPUs, but yeah. Oh, for IPUs. Yeah, my bad. Yeah. 
For no, no worries. The for TPUs, uh, TPUs are not are, are not uh, data flow architectures. They they uh, they they have at the heart of them they have a very efficient matrix computation engine, but they are supported by a very high bandwidth, high performance memory subsystem to move data in and out of uh, this ma- this efficient matrix uh, engine. Nice. Okay. All right. So that is a great introduction to these kind of these popular uh, deep learning accelerators. Um, with GPU, TPU, IPU, there's just like one kind of brand at least for these kinds of chips. But with AWSs, you have these two different brands, Tranium and Inferentia, for related, like they're they're related in some in some way as well. So, uh, could you break down for us? Uh, you know, the similarities and differences between the Tranium and Inferentia chip, which if it isn't obvious from the name, and actually it took me a while to figure this out myself. So like when Shruti first came to me, I was comparing side by side. I had on my screen the, the webpage for Tranium and the webpage for Inferentia. And I was reading through all the detail, all the specs. And I was like, what are the, what's different about these two chips? And then when I kind of like, it's one of those things where like when you step away from the problem, then it hit me. I was like, oh, it's in the name. <laughs> Tranium is for training. Inference is for inference. Come on. Um, but yeah, so what what are the differences between these two chips? Yeah, sure. Uh, so so first of all, I, I think you're right to point out that, uh, that the chips are very similar. And we, we actually do it on purpose. We, we build one chip architecture and then we tailor it for training uh, training workloads with the Tranium form factor and for inference workloads with the Inferentia form factor. So right when we started uh, quite a few years ago, we kind of had the re- realization that every successful uh, machine learning workload will have to have at scale inference deployment. Otherwise, you train, but you don't use the train model. So, so it doesn't make any sense. So. So we kind of looked through the the inference problem and thought through what are the key characteristics of of that that problem. And there are a few items that that we noticed. One is that it's what we call a scale-out problem. So with with inference, you typically don't need to to perform inference on a giant data center, but rather you can do inference on one device or one server and the, the, the more successful your product is, the more customers and requests you get. But then you can deploy, you can scale out the number of servers and just deploy the uh, service, the different requests in parallel. Now, another thing that is unique for inference is that we need to make sure that we can deploy them across the world because typically you want to perform inference close to where the requests are coming from and react very quickly. You, you typically have a latency bump. So we want to make sure that our inference form factor is low power and deployable in every data center in AWS. And we have tens, tens and tens of regions where we deploy inference. Training, on the other hand, is a different story. It's kind of an offline uh, workload where you train on a cluster of many machines, many servers. And in some, right. in some, in some form, the data center becomes the new computer for training for training workloads. You train on tens of thousands of devices together. So that's what's called a scale-up workload, where the, the, the cluster is very tightly connected with one another. And we, we don't need to deploy close to a, a certain user because training runs for days and weeks and, and sometimes even months. So... There is no no problem moving the uh, deploying in in uh, some remote data center and performing the training job there and then getting the results. There's uh, so that uh, that difference, by the way, scale up versus scale out, also means that the amount of communication that we need to pack into the, these different form factors is different. So with Trainium, we need to have a lot of communication capability, very high bandwidth communication capabilities in order to interconnect these uh, chips and servers together. And with Inferentia, while we do need uh, some chip-to-chip connectivity, and that's, that's kind of interesting, we can discuss it uh, further, it doesn't need to be extremely high bandwidth. So we can kind of uh, create two form factors that are different for these two workloads, but leverage the same underlying architecture. 
Okay, so question one is, are you able to explain to me what like form factor exactly means? And then the second, like the follow on question from that is, when you talk about the inferentia chip not needing the same kind of high bandwidth connectivity, I hypothesize that that allows you to ramp something else up. Correct, yes, correct, correct. Uh, so let's talk about both. Uh, form factors are just packaging of the same underlying chip. So I'll actually have a board here. Maybe I can flash it. That's one of the boards that we, we kind of uh, oh, built that's cool. based on these so chips. So our YouTube, the like small percentage of super data science listeners who do it in the video format, you know, hold that up for a sec again. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, they get to they get to actually see like one of these chips up on screen. So uh, when you think about the form factor, you could take, for example, the same chip and put it on a different board with somewhat different characteristics, less input output uh, wires uh, and so on. Right. But it's the same same underlying chip. Uh, so these are different form factors. Right, right, right. So like on that, on the uh, board that you held up there, it looks like there might be like two chips on it. Correct. That's These are two chips. That's actually not the, the chip that we deploy right now. That's something that we, we work on internally. But uh, but yes, that's a form factor with two chips and a certain amount of I.O. Nice, nice, nice. So the, yeah, that's completely new information to me and like super cool because like I kind of like, yeah, I had no idea how to conceptualize this form factor thing. I've heard that before. But now it sounded when I'm talking to you, it's like, yeah, there's so many questions that I've had for you today that I'm like, I would usually just kind of like let it like go. And I'm just like, okay, like weak compute versus strong compute. I kind of like at a high level know, know what it means, but it's awesome to have you actually break it down for us. And so, yeah, so this is a really cool thing too. So with these form factors, you have the same chip, but the way that you connect them to the surrounding board is different, uh, yes. which allows you to take advantage of different. So in the case of going back to the, the second question that I have for you and that you're just about to answer, but I'm not letting you, <laughs> is uh, with Trinium, you had, uh, you're had you uh, specializing in having a high bandwidth uh, connectivity so that you can have a scale up workload uh, supporting lots, potentially tens of thousands of these Trinium chips working together to train a model over days, weeks, or maybe even months. Um, and then so with Inferentia, you can have the same chip but they're connected to the board in a different way, which allows for... Yeah, so the, with, with Inferentia, we, we basically reduce the amount of I.O. or chip-to-chip or -chip connectivity, network connectivity that is not required for inference. And that allows us to do a couple of things. Uh, the first one is to, to reduce costs, and that's important in large-scale deployment. The other thing is to pack more of these compute servers in a single data center rack, and then we can have more compute density within the data center. And again, at the end of the day, it all comes into enabling our customers with best-in-class performance and, and price performance, basically the cost per inference that they can achieve. Cool. This episode is supported by the AWS Insiders Podcast, a fast-paced, entertaining, and insightful look behind the scenes of cloud computing, particularly Amazon Web Services. I checked out the AWS Insiders show myself and enjoyed the animated interactions between seasoned AWS expert Raul. He's managed over 45,000 AWS instances in his career and his counterpart, Hillary, a charismatic journalist turned entrepreneur. Their episodes highlight the stories of challenges, breakthroughs, and cloud computing's vast potential that are shared by their remarkable guests, resulting in both a captivating and informative experience. To check them out yourself, search for AWS Insiders in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to AWS Insiders for their support. So yeah, so it lowers costs, which obviously, yeah, is super important to people, especially in that inference situation, because you are going to, so uh, when you're training a model, you might say, okay, um, you know, we're going to need this many hundreds of processors running for a week in order to train our gigantic large language model. Um, but uh, so, so you're like, you're kind of like, well, that's a one-time cost and I'm willing to eat it and I'm willing to pay extra to have this uh, high bandwidth connectivity to have that training done in uh, one week instead of two. Yep. Um, but when you're doing inference, all of a sudden you're like, okay, this GPU is going to be running 24 seven all the time in order for our users to be able to make use of my LLM. 
And so then once you're in that situation, you're thinking about, okay, if this is running 24-7, 365 days a year, uh, what can be done to lower costs without sacrificing performance? Exactly. But it's this inferentia device that is going to run 24-7, not the GPU. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a bad habit. We got to get, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, the inferential device. Exactly. Nice. All right. So then, <laughs> well, so let me tie my flub and make it seem like I, like there's a reason why I did it on purpose. Uh, so I'm going to tie it into my next question. So, uh, some people out there might have even framed the question that I just did and be thinking about GPUs in the cloud. Um, and so, uh, why, why was the development of these Trainium and, and Inferentia chips necessary? Like what was there out there that your customers needed, that your users needed, that like the existing off-the-shelf GPUs that were designed initially for graphics processing weren't good enough for? And actually, I'm actually, as I asked the question, I'm starting to piece together that you've already kind of given us the answers, which is stuff like, <laughs> yes. like you already, you know, you talked about uh, using the systolic arrays to go from 50 to 99% efficiency. So obviously that's gonna relate to a cost saving. Uh, and then similarly, when people are using a training chip for training or an inferential chip for inference, for the reasons that you already went into, like high bandwidth connect connectivity or increased compute density respectively, these things are going to relate to lower costs for the customer. So did I just answer the whole question or did I leave anything for you? <laughs> exactly. Oh, most of it. But let me let me add just one uh, a little more. But yeah, it's uh, the the underlying reason is exactly what you said. We were trying to provide our customers with the best performance and best price performance, or, or so lower lowest cost also. Um, and when we kind of looked at deep learning, we saw a workload that is exploding in popularity. So it was powering more and more applications, and as it was powering more applications, it was creating more compute demand. And as it was creating more compute demand, it created more uh, investment in terms of infrastructure and research, which improves the algorithm and then powers even more applications. And there's kind of a virtuous cycle here that kind of uh, creates a lot of momentum, momentum for AI. And I think we're seeing it in the last couple of years. So we, we realized that this is a workload that our customers care about a lot. And we, we had very good uh, offerings for our customers based on GPU for this workload. But we kind of stepped back and, and thought about the AWS scale, where we are servicing millions of customers, and whether we can use that scale in order to provide even more benefits, both in terms of performance and cost uh, for our customers. And that's when we, we realized that at this scale, it actually makes a lot of sense to get into a chip development project. It's not a, a, a small investment, but at our scale, it does make sense to make this investment in order to improve performance, cost efficiency, and energy efficiency even more for this workload, and then basically allow that uh, allow a, a, a more optimized infrastructure for our customer, offer more in, uh, optimized infrastructure to our customers, which in turn enables them to, to innovate even more. They can train larger models, they can train for lo longer time and so on. And it kind of creates even more momentum to the cycle that I described before. Nice, so that, uh, that virtuous cycle that you were talking about there between hardware and AI, uh, I think you've called that an AI flywheel effect uh, in other places. Uh, so do you want to dig into that a bit more? I guess like the idea is that when, uh, you know, as there's more advances in AI. So starting with AlexNet now 11 years ago, you know, more and more advances in AI were like, you know, uh, institutions like AWS are able to realize, hey, like there's a huge market here and it's going to be even bigger in the future. Like we're going to have more AI in more devices. Data sets are going to get even bigger and models are going to get even bigger. And then when you create those chips, you get these kinds of efficiencies like going from 50 to 90 percent. Uh, of the energy being spent on math operations. And so then that means that um, a startup like mine, like Nebula, we can then use an inferentia or training chip and we can train the same model at a fraction of the price. And so it allows more companies like mine to be able to afford to create bigger, more powerful models in a wider range of applications, which then means that AWS and other companies, hardware, other hardware designers, We'll say, oh, look at the market's get bigger than ever, and it's going to get even bigger. So let's invest even more money in more chips and so on, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think the 
what what I try to to explain to to myself at least with this uh, flyway flyway uh, uh, method of modeling things is whether there is a spike in usage and that spike will kind of uh, tame down over the next couple of years or whether this is going to keep increasing. And I think there is a, a good uh, reason to believe that uh, AI is going to keep increasing in, in popularity and, and in compute demand over the next couple of years because of the uh, because of the flywheel effect. So, so basically, I was kind of walking through it before, but... But we see in recent years that AI is used in, in many, many applications. So we obviously have chatbots or AI assistants. We have voice generations, recommend, uh, recommendation systems. We have image tagging today. And that's, that's just a fraction. It goes, I can go on and on on all the different use cases. So as you get more use cases, obviously there will be more demand from the compute infrastructure to just do more AI-related compute. And because there's so much demand on the compute infrastructure, it makes sense for both acad- academics and, and industry players to invest more in optimizing that that compute uh, that workload. And that involves tooling, and it involves finding different methods to do things more efficiently. It involves trying to find a, a new algorithms, and that investment unlocks innovation. So one, one recent example that we, we've seen was RLHF, or reinforcement learning from human feedback. So we've seen that get popularized over the, the last couple of years and improve the, the quality of these models such that they can get used in even more applications. So, and so you can see why this kind of feeds into itself and creates even more usage, and that usage creates more innovation and even more usage. So I think... Uh, we we can make a, a decent argument why AI will keep increasing over the next years or maybe even decades, and it's worthwhile investing a big time, investing with big projects in order to make it more efficient. And that's that's what inferential training is all about. Really cool and great example there with the RLHF. Um, so that ties into how we've talked about this on the podcast before, but this is uh, for listeners that aren't aware of it. Uh, this reinforcement learning from human feedback allowed the huge jump in capabilities from GPT-3 to GPT-3.5 and then especially to GPT-4. And it was this idea that by with uh, b- by using user feedback, so OpenAI was able to use thumbs up, thumbs down in their platform um, in order to have this proprietary data set of, the, of um, sentiment effectively on what kinds of responses users are looking for versus not looking for. And that's what allowed GPT-4 in particular to be so intuitive feeling about anticipating the what you're looking for. And so it's like, it's wild to me with GPT-4, for example, that I, I won't tell, like, you know, I'll ask a question and it'll give me a response. And maybe the response wasn't exactly what I was looking for. And I won't say like, uh, you know, that's wrong. This is what I'm looking for. I just, I ask like a tangential question and it seems to intuit that, that it was wrong. Like it was like, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I now see that you were looking for this other thing. And so let me tell you about that. And I'm, I'm like, Whoa, like, yeah, I, that's amazing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so really cool example. And it ties in very nicely to my next question because um, and and kind of builds upon your point, Ron, which is that with RLHF and this kind of amazing utility that we get from GPT-4, it means that more people than ever, whether it's in their personal life or their professional life, can make good use of this large language model. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so, you know, that means that people who are making decisions about investing in hardware will be like, okay, there's obviously going to be way more growth in the future and these models are going to require lots of compute. So, yeah, so I guess, so specifically, I, you know, I had this question for you about how, you know, I, is it, it, I now realize it's almost like, it's a really dumb question. Like the question is, does the popularization of gen, of generative AI increase demand for high performance chips? And obviously the answer is yes. Like, <laughs> yes. so, uh, so maybe uh, I should get to the next question which is uh, a, a little bit more nuanced. And uh, so you might have a more interesting answer to this one, which is, uh, 
uh, I've talked on this show about techniques like low rank adaptation. So parameter or efficient fine tuning. Specifically, I talked about this in episode number 674. And so these techniques like LoRa are designed to allow us to take a big LLM and insert um, relatively uh, rare matrices within the overall architecture. So you add a tiny bit of parameters to your model, like it could be in the area of like half a percent. Um, so, um, so if you had a, ugh, I'm probably going to butcher this math off the top of my head while I'm speaking, but like if you had a model with uh, 10 million parameters, then half a percent would be just uh, 50,000. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you add in like that kind of, uh, that or something by at a, a, a power of 10 close to that. Uh, uh, but yeah, you have this relatively small number of parameters in and then you just tune those. And so people are trying to come up with these kinds of algorithm optimizations for training in order to dramatically reduce the cost of training these LLMs. So you take a pre-trained LLM that you can download open source. And I've had tons of episodes about that recently. Um, stretching back to the llama episode in episode number 670 and a bunch of subsequent Friday episodes. Um, so you get these big open source LLMs, uh, and then you insert this very small number of new matrices to train. Um, and then, yeah, we use this low rank adaptation approach to very, uh, parameter efficiently train these models. Uh, and there's other kinds of optimizations like quantization. So using, um, uh, you know, instead of using full precision floating point numbers, we use, you know, half precision or smaller. So I guess, um, do you think that like these kinds of optimizations uh, could mean that there will be like a somewhat smaller demand at some point in the future um, for hardware? Or is it basically that like, you know, over because we're seeing such enormous improvements in capability by scaling up models to be very large? that these kinds of algorithmic optimizations like LoRa and quantization uh, will just somewhat reduce, but on like, but not substantially reduce this explosive demand for hardware. Yeah, so I, first of all, I, I'd say that uh, since the release of the Llama model and weights, uh, what was ha what's happening in the in the community is amazing. So the amount of innovation and the pace of innovation that the, uh, that we're seeing is is absolutely fantastic. And all these ideas like LoRa and QLoRa are coming into the uh, kind of the front stage and improving the efficiency of these models. That's fantastic. I think that uh, there will be there there will be some use cases where you can run efficiently on the end con the consumer hardware and it will be efficient enough. Uh, and in these cases will probably be the, the cases where the model can be small enough and the, the rate of interaction with the model is relatively slow. And then you can run it on a mobile device, on a laptop, and, and it's still fast enough. Uh, when you go to mass deployments, when you need to, where you need to service millions of requests a day or, or sometimes even more than that, I think the, the the physics of generative AI models will, will come into play. And eventually these models are extremely, extremely memory hungry. So, uh, so it will be more efficient to do them on the cloud with dedicated hardware that is efficient for that. Uh, so that's one case where I think uh, cloud backing will still, will still be useful. Uh, and on top of that, uh, as far as I can tell right now, there will be a small models that are that sacrifice a bit of the quality of the results, may, maybe very minimally for performance and for cost. But there will be cases where we want to achieve the maximum highest quality results, and then you want to deploy a two hundred billion parameter model or something like that, and that's hard to do on consumer grade hardware. The future of AI shouldn't be just about productivity. An AI agent with the capacity to grow alongside you long-term could become a companion that supports your emotional well-being. Peridot, an AI companion app developed by With Feeling AI, reimagines the way humans interact with AI today. Using their proprietary large language models, Peridot AI agents store your likes and dislikes in a long-term memory system, enabling them to recall important details about you and incorporate those details into dialogue without 
LLM's typical context window limitations. Explore what the future of human AI interactions could be like this very day by downloading the Peridot app via the Apple App Store or Google Play, or by visiting peridot.ai on the web. Totally, yeah. All those answers make perfect sense, and, and they were in line with, that, with what I was expecting, but it was nice to hear like that level of detail from you. Um, and then you also, you hit on a really great point there, which is that like things like Llama, Vicuña, Alpaca, GPT-4LJ, Dolly 2.0, like all these kinds of open source architectures that we can download and then use Laura to fine tune to our needs. That in and of itself, even though you're like, okay, with Laura with training, we're like, okay, there's not that many parameters that we need to train. But you then have, like you're saying, this explosion in people being like, oh, I'd love to do it, which increases demand. And then yes, your point right there, which I completely was absent on, but at inference time, it doesn't matter that I had a small amount of weights during training. So even if I, so like if I was right about that math going from the 10 million uh, down to the 50,000, uh, I'd still at inference time, I can't do inference with the 50,000. I need to use the full 10 million. So, uh, so yeah, so at inference time, you know, you're still, you're still going to have all that demand. Uh, and then hopefully your application takes off and hopefully lots of these, you know, more and more of these applications are going to take off. So there's going to be more and more demand for the inference time chips. And then just as you say, the tr a trip like Tranium is going to be in demand because yeah, people, you know, we're constantly pushing the state of the art with these huge scaled up models with hundreds of billions of parameters. Um, and those are the most powerful general purpose ones. So that'll continue to happen and people will continue to use those, um, as, you know, a starting point for, for distillation or proving. Um, but yeah, cool. All right. So that's wild. So we just got through, like I had five different kind of sections of topics to go over and we just got through the first one. <laughs> uh, that's so awesome. Um, and I love it. Like those, you know, I, I had it as the first section for a reason. I thought it was like, you know, some really exciting stuff. I mean, we still have obviously lots of other really exciting topics, but, um, yeah, it was awesome to be able to dig uh, with you, Ron, into so much of these technical things related to hardware. So um, at my second topic area for our listeners is, as a chip designer, what is your long-term vision when you architect a new chip? So when you talk about something like a $100 million project, obviously that is happening over an extended period of time. So you have to make predictions about what people are going to need many years from now in their devices. How do you go about... Uh, doing that kind of long-term design. Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one. And it's a it's one of the, the areas where I think experience actually matter, matters, where you kind of see if chips that succeeded and chips that didn't succeed as much, you kind of get a, a good hunch of a, where to focus on. Um, and just before I answer, I would also add that the way that we build chips, the, the first the, the first copy of the chip costs about $20 million to manufacture. But then every every other chip, every other copy of the chip after that costs tens of dollars or, or maybe a hundred of dollars. So that's that's a very unique uh, unique setup, especially when when described to software folks, because the cost of a mistake is brutal. If you need to fix a mistake and remanufacture the chip, that's an extra $20 million right there. <laughs> so you really need to be confident about two things about the specifications of the chip that you generated and also about the level of testing that you did so that there's there won't be a silly bug that causes us to remanufacture the chip so with that kind of preface um we uh, I, I think what you said is exactly right when uh, building chips is a, a of decent complexity is a process that takes about two years time it's not a quick process and then we build servers and deploy them into the data center. And people use them for quite a few years, three, four, five years. So when we start a new chip project, we try to anticipate what's going to happen over the next five, six, or seven years. And that's extremely hard to do for, for almost any workload, but especially in AI, where things change in, in a super rapid pace, right? Um, and it's, it's very tempting to try to guess what changes will come in three or four years? But uh, but I think it's I, I honestly think it's impossible. I think no one knows where AI will evolve into in the next uh, five years or so. So one of or, or two techniques that we try to to deploy or that I I at least try to deploy every time I, I go and build a new chip is uh, the first one is 
to look at the workload and try not to target the current popular workload, but rather try to decompose it into primitives, <coughs> generalize the primitives, and build a, 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 mach a machine, a chip, that is very efficient in uh, offloading or accelerating these different primitives and let our customers kind of play Lego with these primitives and create a new workload five years out from now. So that's one, the, the ability to break down to primitive, primitives and try to generalize them. The second one uh, is something that I, I personally took from, from Charlie Munger, actually. So I, I love following Charlie Munger. I, I find him super wise. And he has this set of mental models that he uses for a bunch of decision-making, uh, uh, the, the decision points that you need to make. And one of them I, I especially like. It's a, it's a mental mo model called inversion. And the idea is that whether on the, on the professional life, by the way, or on the personal life, if you have a question that is super hard to answer, try to invert the question and answer the, that inverted question. In many, in many cases, it's much easier to answer the inverted question, and then it guides you through how to deal with the more complex question. So if I kind of try to tie that back to what you asked, we're trying to build a chip that will last for five, seven years or something like that. And the question that we're asking ourselves is what's going to change over the next five years and we need to prepare the chip for? What kind of future-looking features should we build in? And I would argue that if we invert the question, it can give us a lot of clarity. So what's not going to change in AI over the next five to seven years? Um, and that's, that's actually a simple question to answer. So yeah, like I, linear algebra operations. <laughs> linear algebra <laughs> operations are here to stay. Uh, different data types are here to stay. Like we saw FP32 and Bfloat16. Uh, and it's, it sounds intuitive now, but when we just started, folks were arguing that we need to build uh, chips that only do int8 and nothing else, int8 math and nothing else. And we were saying, no, that's that's it. Too, uh, too significant of a bet. Right now, people are using all kinds of different data types. So we, we figured we need to allow our customers with this flexibility to choose the data type that is optimal for their use case. And, and by the way, even more intuitive uh, things than that. So there's no, no chance in the world in five years, people won't want, want high performance. Everyone wants more speed, right? Everyone wants lower cost. So we, we, we try to design the chips around the things that we know are going to be needed. And then, as I said before, try to generalize the primitives and not kind of overfit uh, if I use the uh, ML lingo to, to one specific workload. <laughs> nice. That's a great example. Yeah. And so Charlie Munger, for a bit of context, uh, for our listeners who haven't heard of him, uh, he is Warren Buffett's business partner at Berkshire Hathaway. And so probably most people have heard of Warren Buffett. A few years ago, he was the wealthiest person on the planet, uh, largely on the back of his big holding company, Berkshire Hathaway. And Charlie Munger is Warren's right-hand man. And I think he's 100 years old now. If I... Something like uh, 98 or 100, something in these lines. Yeah. Still and sharp as a, as a knife. Yeah, that's what they say. People like friends of mine were posting from like the most recent Berkshire Hathaway uh, annual general shareholders meeting, photos like with Charlie Munger and just saying, yeah, how sharp he is. And yeah, he's like, he's famous for like how much he reads and how widely he reads. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. So his inversion approach, uh, yeah, makes it answer, makes it easier to answer difficult questions. And you gave a perfect example there where like, yeah, when you're trying to figure out what will change, answer the question, what will not change? And you're, you're absolutely right. That did make it easier to understand. And I'm going to try to remember to apply this in my personal and professional life. I hadn't heard before. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess there's like a lot of different aspects to, uh, to chip design, lots of different, uh, things that you need to, uh, weigh against each other. Um, so Serge Massis, who is our researcher for the show, um, and who has been on the show in the past. Um, so he has an awesome episode on explainable AI, uh, that was episode number 539. And, uh, yeah, so Serge had some additional questions around terms that I don't know anything about. I mean, so one of them is memory. I know that. But then there's also like accelerator interconnect, dynamic execution, collective communications. So like, how, yeah, I mean, how, how do you weigh all these different things? 
And I don't know, maybe we don't want to get too down in the weeds on this, but uh, yeah, if you think there's something else kind of interesting, additional to say related to design, that'd be cool. Sure, yeah. So, so I think uh, if, if we kind of kind of touch briefly on these different topics, so accelerator interconnect, or sometimes called the chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, is how we interconnect these chips with one another so that they can exchange data quickly with one another. Back in the days, it used to be gradients. In today's workloads with gigantic models, it actually tends to be a temporal state or activations that move between the different, uh, uh, between the different chips. It even at some uh, for for the very large models, we actually even perform one giant matrix multiply, a feed forward network, on multiple chips, and then we kind of take a, a matrix, kind of partition it column wise or row wise, spread it across chips, and and then assemble the result back. So that's done via chip to chip uh, uh, interconnect. So just high speed I/O at the end of the day. A collective communication is the, the set of primitives that is used to transfer data in an, in an orchestrated manner between the chips over this chip-to-chip -chip interconnect. And I think you touched on dynamic execution as well. Uh, yeah. Dynamic execution is, is, uh, is something that is, is challenging to some chips, especially highly parallelizable chips. Uh, and the idea is that... Uh, if, if we kind of uh, use software uh, terminology as, a, uh, as an example, if you have an if condition in the middle of the code, then uh, you, you, you get dynamic execution. Based on the data that, uh, that, uh, that is being processed, you decide whether to execute one piece of the code or the other. Now, in CPU, it's actually it's, it's not very, it's very hard to do. It's just a branch instruction. That means that the next instruction is fetched from a different location. In highly parallelizable machines, that's actually harder to do because think about many cores processing data at the same time, and then some of them do need to branch and the others don't, don't need to branch, and all of a sudden they go out of sync from one another. So we need to build some mechanisms in order to deal with that efficiently. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so thank you for those introductions to those concepts. Um, and yeah, so I guess like as you're weighing all these different kinds of things, uh, you're kind of using this inversion approach to say, okay, you know, we know uh, that people are going to want these to be cheaper, <laughs> but, but more powerful. And so, yeah, how can we engineer all these different aspects together while delivering those uh, outcomes? Right. Yeah, so, so exactly. I forgot about the how, how do we weigh these different things together? So uh, the first thing that we always try to do, and, and that's actually, I, I find it to be critical, is to try to simulate the workload on the hardware as the, we build the primitives. And that, that allows you, us to kind of think top down rather than bottoms up. So instead of kind of trying to build all kinds of engines and then at the very end, look at how we can uh, kind of force them to run the workloads that customers care about, we start with a couple of workloads, try to make them different than one another to kind of have a, a large span of different usages of the hardware and try to simulate it on, a, on the hardware that we're thinking about building and trying to see how, see how things will play out. So this allows us to, to get a better mental model on how, a, how to, a, to partition the device and what capabilities the chip needs to have. And then the, the next thing after that is, so we, we talked about the, the inversion uh, approach. So basically, if we talk about dynamic execution, are we sure that dynamic execution will, uh, will be needed, right? Um, and and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure, to be honest, but, uh, or I wasn't sure for four years ago when we started, uh, when we did training, uh, training one. But uh, but if we look, uh, but if we invert this question, are we sure that we won't need inversion? The answer is absolutely not. We, we're not certain they not, won't need a, sorry, a dynamic execution. The, the answer is not. We, we're not certain that we, it won't be needed. So we build this capability and we build enough flexibility into the hardware in order to, uh, to deal with that. And maybe one, one more sentence on that. The, what we do for these kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, problems or requirements is actually kind of interesting. Uh, on the one hand, we want the the chip and the hardware to be as optimized as, as possible, right? To to perform the computation at, at wire speed, to do to do it at very low energy consumption, and so on. On the other hand, we want it to be very flexible. Uh, so we need to balance these uh, two, and it's it's kind of a tough task. 
Uh, and what we end up doing typically is that we take the main data part, the, the part that needs to be the, the number crunching, and we highly optimize it by hand. We make it as efficient as it can be. But then we attach a small microprocessor. Think about a small CPU to that data path, and that processor can make all kinds of control decision, like an if condition that we, decided, that we said before, or like deciding how data moves from one data path stage to the other in order to get all the flexibility that we can. And in some way, we get both the flexibility and the efficiency by combining things this way. Wow, that's wild. So like... So flexibility means that um, that the device can handle like a wider range of operations, for example. Is that kind of what flexibility means? 100% right. And, and I have a, a, an interesting example uh, on that one. So when we built the fir our first deep learning chip in Forentia 1, uh, that was before Transformer existed. We started building this chip a, a, a year or two before that. So uh, we, oh, two years before that. So. The, the most popular workload back in the day was, was ResNet. You, you could uh, also, everyone knew about L LSTMs back then. So, and, and th there were a couple of hardware vendors that were building convolutional network optimized machines because that was the, the, the highly popular workload. And we actually got recommendations to do the same. Uh, basically, convolution, convolutional neural network is the future. Go build only that. And again, we we uh, we use the same the same techniques that I that I told you about before to to not do that. Basically, we don't yeah. we, we don't have conviction that CNN is the future. Let's not uh, tie ourselves to that uh, to that workload only. Uh, so we decompose things to the uh, to the primitives, and you can think about one of the primitives of a neural network is a nonlinear function, uh, what we call activation. Um, and back then, Relu was starting. Actually, Relu, Sigmoid, and Tanage was very were very popular. These three. So it was it would have been very simple to just hard code these three a nonlinear function into the device, and whatever new nonlinearity comes uh, comes our way, we cannot support. But again, for the same exact reason and exactly what you said before, we knew that we need to to make sure that. Uh, we can support new instructions and operators that we don't even know about today. Um, so that's how we try to decompose things. We try to make the nonlinear uh, engine a, a very flexible engine that can handle any scalar type of processing, including all nonlinearities. And as we deployed the chip, Transformer ate the world, came, uh, came to be and, and became super popular. And uh, for the for the one two years after our deployment, Transformer was actually our number one workload, and it was a workload that we didn't even know about when we built the chip. So that actually uh, is a good data point that uh, that speaks to the flexibility, the the right flexibility point that we built into the chip. Such a great example, I love that, and it makes it so crystal clear to me what flexibility is. Um, so yeah, so instead of building a convolutional neural network specific architecture. You wanted to be able to support a wider range of operations, which ended up being critical when transformers started eating the world. Um, awesome. All right. So transformers require, well, maybe don't require, but the best use of transformers we've seen today involves a lot of scale. So yep. having a large number of transformers in one architecture, as well as using a lot of data, uh, then to uh, train that architecture um, following things like the chinchilla scaling laws that I've talked about previously uh, in episode number 676. And so scale is really important, model scale, uh, data scale. Um, so um, when we scale, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we might use tens of thousands of accelerators, like training accelerators, for example, for training our model. Um, so obviously we're distributing compute across many different machines, many different resources. Um, so, uh, how does this work? Uh, like maybe like in a bit of technical detail, I know, I know that there's like different kinds of parallelism that you can probably speak to, um, in a lot more detail than I could like data parallelism, model parallelism, tensor parallelism, and pipeline parallelism. Right. Yes. So, so yes, yeah, scaling a model is, is actually an art, a system optimization art, uh, these days. There are a couple of different ways of doing it, but uh, one class of ways to scale out a model uh, is called uh, 3D parallelism. 
And 3D parallelism involves uh, both data and, and model parallelism, and actually two forms of model parallelism. So maybe I can kind of try to describe them one by one. Uh, data parallelism is the simplest form of scale up. You basically, if your model is small enough to fit on a single trainium accelerator, which in, in the LLM case is it's not true, but let's start there. Um, so if it's small enough to fit on one, we basically train the entire model, or we, or we, we do the sorry, we do the forward and backward path of the model on each one of the accelerators, and then each training device computes the gradients, and then they exchange the gradients between them to average and get to to a total uh, gradient update value. At that point, we run the optimizer, which updates the weights with the new values, and all accelerators get the new values and perform forward, backward path again until we converge at some point. So if we look, let's say, uh, four or five years back, that was the, the most popular form of parallelism, data parallelism. Now, when the models become uh, larger than the memory of a single accelerator, this is no longer an option because in order to do what I just described, we need to fit the model on a single accelerator. So the first thing that we do uh, is typically called tensor parallelism. And tensor parallelism basically takes every matrix vector or matrix matrix operation and shards that operation either on the row dimension or on the column dim dimension. And then if we have, let's call it 16 trainium devices that are doing uh, the same computation with a tensor parallelism degree of 16 per the number of accelerators, each one is going to get one over 16 of the weights of each layer, perform a portion of the computation, and then we use the chip-to-chip -chip interconnect that we talked about before in order to assemble the result from that matrix-matrix multiplication and spread it across all the chips. So by doing that, we basically effectively increase the HBM or the memory that is attached to one accelerator to the total HBM of 16 accelerators. So think about instead of 32 gigabytes, we can get 512 gigabytes. And we can do it with very minimal overheads. You can the, the amount of overheads that tensor parallelism uh, uh, induces, if you do it correctly, if you kind of overlap between communication and computation, is in the uh, is in the order of five seven percent. So we can do it extremely efficiently. That's the fir first form of parallelism. So now we have five twelve gigabytes of memory with sixteen of these devices. But what happens if the model is gigantic, if it's one trillion parameters? Then it doesn't even fit on 512 gigabytes. And when that happens, we, we actually, uh, and, and actually it, it doesn't even fit for smaller models than that, for 200 billion parameters. It all already doesn't fit because we need to store both the weights and the gradients. So, uh, so at that time, that's where we introduce what's called pipeline parallelism. And what that means is basically that we sp uh, split the layers on groups of 16 training devices that are doing tensor parallelism. So let's say 16 training devices will do the first 10 layers, the other ones will do the next 10 layers, and so on and so on. And then we make sure to pass the data between each groups of accelerators, but we need to do it on the forward pass and the backward path while keeping the weights and gradients uh, local for each group of 16, which makes for uh, certain uh, bubbles of idleness for the accelerators that we need to solve in some way. And there are all kinds of techniques in order to solve that, but I'll, I'll pause here to, uh, to, to give you a chance to follow up. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's great. I think I followed all of it. So um, data parallelism is uh, the simplest, I think, conceptually, where you can fit a model onto a single device. So then you can just, uh, you know, if you want to have 16 accelerators, each with a model loaded on it, uh, you simply flow different data points into each of those 16 uh, devices. Um, and then you can accumulate your gradients across those different devices um, and allow you to just end up with one model in the end. Yep. Um, we need tensor parallelism when the model doesn't fit onto a single device. Um, and uh, this allows us to scale up to 512 gigs um, of weights across different accelerators. but um, sometimes even that isn't enough, and then we need to go to a pipeline parallelism, uh, where in that case uh, we're we're additionally breaking up 
the training into different layers? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just tackling uh, some of the layers at a time because we can't even infer over the whole model. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We can't inf do inference over uh, uh, all, of, all, all of the layers, even in just a part of the model. Right. Yes. And there are others. That's only one class of parallelism, by the way. There's another cr class of parallelism that stemmed from a paper called the Zero, Zero Redundancy Optimizer. And uh, there are a lot of similarities, but the, the main difference is that instead of doing pipeline parallelism, as I described before, where we split the, mod the model on the layer dimension between different groups of accelerators, instead of doing that, we, we still Shard, we still shard the model on the on the layer dimension, but we read the weights remotely from a different set of accelerators, but run the entire model on, on a single set of devices. So slightly different, more more network uh, uh, demanding, but uh, but uh, similar in approach uh, in some way. Very interesting. Um, so yeah, so super cool. So this gives us a. Yeah, a good sense of how uh, models can be split up depending on their size. Um, from my research notes from Serge, uh, he also pointed out to me that there's something called the Trinium Ultra Cluster. And so um, this allows us to connect over 10,000 training devices in a single cluster. So what kinds of challenges come up when we're dealing with that kind of enormous scale and what kinds of models are making use of that enormous scale? Uh, that's a fantastic question, yes. So, so first of all, uh, it was up to 10,000 training devices. It's up to 30,000 training devices today, so we keep increasing <laughs> it. Um, it let's start with the type of models that use it. When, when you're training a giant LLM, when we're talking about 200 billion parameters, or maybe even more, maybe more towards the, the 1 trillion uh, parameters, uh, you have to train on a gigantic number of uh, devices. We're talking about tens of thousands of devices in order for your training to finish in a reasonable amount of time. What, what we don't want to do is train for, for six months and then we cannot iterate. We just wait for training to, to complete. So uh, that's the reason that we build these ultra clusters. We want our customers to be able to, to get this really extremely powerful powerful high performance computing cluster and train in reasonable time complete and move to the the next model or the next iteration of the model and as you said this comes with some challenges especially the interconnect between between devices uh, that's the reason we actually built an amazon internal network protocol called, called scalable reliable data datagram which allows us to automatically do traffic steering. So when we identify hotspots within the fabric, let's say a switch that got congested or anything like that, we automatically can kind of bypass the congested point and make sure that the devices still get maximum bandwidth between them. So, so first of all, we deploy these unique algorithms in order to automatically recover from failures or, and from hotspots. And the, the second thing that we do is that we build this infrastructure with an extremely optimized network that has zero oversubscription. So basically, you can uh, you can send a, a packet from one training device to the other with a, with a guarantee that you'll get the maximum bandwidth between them. And no matter what other traffic is running in the cluster, you'll still get the maximum bandwidth. And that's just super critical for these workers. Wow, yeah, it's fascinating to be involved in that space. Um, so uh, this you've given us a great sense of um, the hardware side of things in order to be able to have these extremely large models uh, trained efficiently. Um, you know, going a little bit more to the software side, uh, the kinds of popular machine learning frameworks that we use to build these models are PyTorch and TensorFlow. So uh, in order to be able to use these popular uh, these popular deep learning libraries on your hardware on Inferentia and Trinium chips, we need like special considerations. Like, you know, like you 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 spend all this time configuring aspects of the chips and the boards and the way that everything clusters together, so that it's it's you know it all can be optimal. But in order for our software, our machine learning frameworks, 
to interface with that optimally, um, AWS has created the Neuron SDK, Software Development Kit. So uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you can just tell us a bit more about that and why this is essential um, for making the most of your specialized hardware accelerators. Awesome, yes. So, so Neuron is absolutely critical for making Trenium and Inferentia successful. And, and the reason, it's, it's kind of funny, I, I kinda, I'm trying to think about the answer and, and one thing keeps coming to my mind. We have a, a, the, the original Annapurna CTO who's now a, a VP and distinguished engineer in, in Amazon, keeps telling us, I, I swear I hear it once a week or something like that, don't be cheap heads. And what he means by that <laughs> is don't think only about the chip, but rather how people will consume the chip, how the software folks that need to run their workload will experience that chip. So uh, at the very first day of building Trainium and Inferentia, we started thinking about the software integration into PyTorch, TensorFlow, and now JAX also, uh, and trying to make the experience for our users as seamless as possible. So uh, one thing that, uh, again, is very tempting to do, and I've seen folks do it, is to create what's called a model zoo. So basically, you have a set of optimized models that you implemented for your hardware, and customers can choose from these models and run them on your hardware. But in my, in my opinion, that's, that's absolutely the wrong way to go, because customers don't want to be limited to a set of 20 models. They want to allow their teams to innovate and come with their own models and their own operators and the, their, their own extensions and still have it run as effectively as possible uh, on the heart. So for that, we have a couple of things that we built within the Neuron stack. The first uh, is the Neuron compiler. And the Neuron compiler is quite a, a, a significant and, and, a, and a, a sophisticated uh, a piece of software that basically does two things. It does lowering and optimization. So it starts by capturing a graph from the framework level, whether it's PyTorch or anything else. And then it encodes the computation graph that you described, whether it's transformer or anything else, into, a, into a, what we call an intermediate representation. So that's sort of a file that describes the entire computation. And each and the, and the file is, is constructed as a graph with uh, with nodes that perform computation and dependencies or, or, uh, or, or edges that go from the output of one operator to, to the input of, an, of another one. Uh, after doing that, we do uh, something that is uh, basically the heart of the neuron compiler, which is what we call the tensorizer sometimes. Uh, we sometimes call it also the middle end of the compiler. So we basically take each and every operator and describe it in loop formats. So for example, if we have a convolution or a matrix multiplication, we can describe it as a nested set of loops where at the very in, uh, innermost loop, we get some scalar operations that do a multiplication and addition. And that's, that's how you can describe matrix multiplication. And then once we have things described in this way, we can apply a set of, of very significant optimizations that will target the hardware better. So just to give you a sense of things that we do, we would fuse loops together. Uh, and, and by fusing loops together, we actually, it's kind of hard to, to envision, but we actually minimize data movement and memory footprint. So let's try to kind of visualize that. If you have a set of loops doing a matrix multiplication, and then a set of loops doing a nonlinearity, a JLU activation on the result, when the, make the, when the loops are not fused together, you'll do the entire matrix multiplication, write the result to some memory location, and then enter the second loop, which reads everything, and then, and then uh, uh, performs the, uh, the nonlinearity, the JLU activation. If we fuse the loops together, we can basically get to a point where every single tile of matrix multiply that gets completed immediately goes through the, the nonlinearity and only then gets written to memory. And by doing that, we, we reduce what we call the working set, the amount of memory that we need to keep cached at the time. And by, by doing that, we keep the data, the data local, we reduce the amount of bandwidth that we need from the memory and improve performance overall. 
I kind of try to speed things up to not describe the entire stack, but mm-hmm. uh, but at the very end of this tensorizer stage, we take the innermost loops and we kind of collapse them into hardware intrinsics, basically instructions that can be uh, executed by the hardware with a single instruction. So if I kind of try to tie to, to the uh, beginning of our con- conversation, we had the, the large systolic array that can do matrix multiplications very efficiently. So if we... So we t- let's say that the matrix, the, the systolic array can handle 128 by 128 matrix multiplies. So we create an inner tile from the loop with 128 by 128 dimension, and we lower that to a single hardware instruction. And we eventually perform scheduling and allocation to maximize communication and comput- computation at the same time and target the hardware in the most efficient way. So I'll say one more thing, and then I'll, I'll pause again. Um, <laughs> So that's one, that's one kind of theme of making it as easy as possible for customers to target our hardware. At the end of the day, they need to add two lines of code that basically uh, instruct the, the, the compiler what are the edges of the graph that you want to, to target the device, that you want to compile, and everything else happens behind the scenes. The other key capability that we bake into the hardware and the software stack is what we call custom operators. Uh, you touched on um, QLOR uh, before and about uh, the innovations of doing 4-bit inference and, and, uh, and so on. That's exactly the reason that we built this mechanism that we call custom operators. At its heart, it's just a set of deeply embedded vector processors that are inside our Trinium compute units. And they have access to the other, the other engines in the caches. And the, the nice thing is that they can run your C code without our involvement at all. So you can compile the entire graph, but then let's say you have this magic operator that you want to deploy and you don't even want to share it with us. So it can be int4 to, to int8 dequantization. It could be zero decompression or it can be anything like that. Uh, so you can build this operator uh, and, and target our hardware and run it in conjunction with the rest of the, the graph that our software stack compiled. So these two together are very powerful, in, in my opinion. Nice. Yeah, such an amazing explanation. And it's mind-blowing for me the depth of knowledge that you have, in particular, about deep learning operations. I mean, I guess in, to some extent, you'd, you'd have to, given what I now know about your role. But coming into this interview, I had no idea that, as a chip designer, you'd have to know this level of detail around exactly the operations that are happening um, in a given uh, deep learning model. So yeah, super cool to hear all that. Um, and yeah, I think another cool thing about this neuron SDK that you've just been describing is that um, it it does also involve collaboration with the community, especially with the PyTorch team. Um, so I don't know if there's anything about that that you want to specifically mention or if I, that kind of just covers it. <laughs> No, it's absolutely true. We we uh, we love collaborating with the PyTorch team. Uh, we actually collaborate between us, uh, Meta, with PyTorch, and Google with XLA. So the the three companies are collaborating quite uh, quite tightly with one another. And we uh, one of the things that we try to do together is to make sure that the entire stack is integrated well together. Uh, so I didn't talk about that, but the front end to our compiler is called XLA, and XLA is an open consortium these days, where our attempt, our, our goal is to make sure that all hardware devices have the same entry point so that integrating different hardware devices from any framework will be much easier. Um, so that's one. The second one is that we uh, we try to contribute back to 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 uh, PyTorch, especially with distribution techniques, uh, just like we described before, such that the, these distribution techniques, just like a zero that I that I mentioned with a library called FSDP uh, in 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 PyTorch, we contribute back to that library such that the uh, the scale out will happen as efficiently as possible on the Trainium and Inferentia targets with the minimum uh, effort required from our customers, or, or actually the, the, the goal is for it to be zero effort from our customers. Nice, very cool. I actually wasn't aware of until you mentioned it just now, and I just did a quick uh, Google search to learn more about Google XLA. Um, so it's this uh, accelerated linear algebra um, library. And so it's cool to hear that this is kind of a standard across um, hardware devices, 
yes. um, to allow yeah these these machine learning, uh, particularly deep learning, uh, linear algebra operations to be run, uh, you know, across across all these different kinds of devices. Very cool. I had no idea about that. Um, so to sort of uh, start to wrap up, <laughs> um, to get into your career a bit, you are a physicist and electrical engineer by training. And before Amazon, you worked for other chip uh, for other chip makers, Zoran and Annapurna, which, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Annapurna was acquired by Amazon. Right. Um, so, how did you get involved in deep learning specific chip design? Like, as I was talking about a few minutes ago, you clearly have this huge depth of knowledge in the space. Was AI always an interest of yours, or you know, how did this this come about? It's kind of funny. Uh, since I remember myself, I, I, I kind of had two major points of interest technology-wise. Uh, one was math and algorithms. I, I always was drawn to, to this area. And the other one was building things, building compute systems and so on. Um, and I was fortunate enough that my, my career kind of evolved in that direction as well. So I, uh, I used to do security products or cryptographic accelerators. Uh, I moved to doing uh, compression and error correction code uh, for, for certain chips. And in all, in all of these cases, we, we basically combined a, a deep familiarity with, uh, with math algorithms and how to build them effectively in hardware. Uh, so when, we, uh, when, when I joined Annapurna Labs, uh, I kind of took ownership of the, the math-related acceleration uh, uh, engines that we, we had to build. So we had a cryptographic engine. We, we worked on a DPU, a data path processing unit or data center processing unit, which later, uh, it was the first in the world, by the way, and it later evolved to be the AWS Nitro product that uh, is pretty well known today. Uh, but then as we identify this AI flywheel and, and, the, and the need to, to service it and provide our customers with the best possible performance and price performance, it was kind of natural for me to take a crack at uh, understanding the math algorithms and tying it back to hardware. So I was uh, requested to, uh, to, to take on that effort. And, and I'm very fortunate to, to have done that because it's, it's a blast. I enjoy it a lot. Nice. Yeah, it's certainly an amazing place to be, as I'm sure a lot of our listeners would agree. And we are all grateful to have you, Ron, working on these kinds of innovations to allow our side of the flywheel uh, to be accelerating as well and to be able to build lots of cool real world applications using your hardware. Um, you have over 200 patents across a wide range of areas, security chips, compilers, AI accelerators. Um, what do you see happening for you next? Is I, I imagine there could be a huge amount of depth in this AI area and you're just kind of like, give me AI all the time for as long as I can, or yeah, what do you see for yourself going forward? Uh, so, so I'm having a blast with, with our AI teams. Uh, I, I especially enjoy uh, working in Amazon. We have a bunch of super talented teams across a wide range of uh, domain expertise, compilers and servers and chips and, uh, and firmware. Uh, so I, for now, I don't see anything, uh, anything other than <laughs> continuing to make this, uh, this as, as efficient and as optimized as possible. And time will tell what's next after that. Uh, very cool, Ron. All right. So before I let you go, a question that I ask all of our guests is, do you have a book recommendation for us? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one for me because most of the, the books that I read are technical books. Uh, but there is well, a book that you I can read. You can give us a technical one too, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever you think is best. No, that's, that's fine. I, I think a, a book that I read recently and I, I found it uh, to be illuminating is uh, Richer, Wiser, Happier. Uh, which talks about investors, uh, including Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. I I just find that these folks are are they're they're operating in such a complex field where you're probably even the, the most successful ones are wrong 40, 45 percent of the time because you need to bet about the future and getting into their mindset and their mental models and how they deal with uh, with making these decisions. Uh, is is super fascinating to me, and uh, in many cases, the, these are also folks that you can learn just uh, just uh, uh, tricks on how to live a happy life from. So I, I love that book. 
Sweet. Well, great to have Charlie Munger back in the conversation. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, Ron, this has been an extraordinary episode for me. I've learned a ton about an area that I previously knew a little about. I'm sure our listeners loved hearing from you as well. How can they follow you to, yeah, uh, you know, after this podcast, if they want to hear more of your thoughts or, you know, uh, be in the loop on other podcast appearances or YouTube videos or whatever that you make, how can they do that? Sure. So I'm, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter, uh, more, more active on LinkedIn, to be honest. And uh, yeah, uh, happy to, to hear from anyone interested. Nice. All right. Thanks so much, Ron. Uh, this has been a fantastic episode, as I already said. And yeah, uh, maybe at some point we can check in again in the future and hear about the hardware innovations that are happening now. Thanks for having me, John. It was a blast. Well, what an intensely educational conversation that was for me. I hope you took a ton away from it too. In today's episode, Ron filled us in on how GPUs with optimization for massively parallel workloads enabled the deep learning to bring about the modern AI era. He talked about how specialized AI accelerators like TPUs, IPUs, and his own Tranium and Inferentia chips can greatly exceed GPUs' capacities and efficiencies because they were designed from the ground up specifically for deep learning. He talks about how the same microchip can be connected to a circuit board in different ways so that one, like the Tranium chip, can be optimized for high bandwidth connectivity, while another accelerator like the Inferentia chip can be optimized for greater compute density. He talked about how Charlie Munger's inversion exercise guides him on the multi-year journey of chip design, as well as many other uh, life decisions of his. He talked about how data, tensor, and pipeline parallelism enables massive models such as LLMs to be trained even if they have trillions of parameters. And he filled us in on how the Neuron SDK integrates AWS AI accelerator hardware into the popular PyTorch and TensorFlow libraries. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Ron's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 691. That's superdatascience.com slash 691. If you live in the New York area and you would like to engage with me in person, not just online, on July 14th, I'll be filming a Super Data Science episode live on stage at the New York R Conference. My guest will be Chris Wiggins, who's chief data scientist at the New York Times, as well as a faculty member at Columbia University. So not only can we meet and enjoy a beer together, but you can also contribute to an episode of this podcast directly by asking Professor Wiggins your burning questions on stage. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another deeply fascinating episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors. Please consider supporting the show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. Finally, thanks, of course, to you for listening all the way to the very end of the show. I hope I can continue to make episodes you enjoy for many years to come. Well, until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.